Never be afraid to ask questions, right? I hope you encourage your kids to ask questions. Ask questions about the faith. We need to always, always welcome questions. Listen to it. This is a quote I found this past week. The longer an unanswered question lurks, the more it erodes the confidence to trust in something. Think about that. Looking for a new car, asking questions, a vacuum cleaner, what kind. The longer your unanswered question lingers, it erodes confidence. Most of us know someone who has walked away from the faith tragically because they could not escape the quicksand of an unanswered question. Hopefully this short little why series has helped answer some of those nagging questions that people are facing. And as we uh, dig in today, I'm going to start off with a poem. Do you like reading poetry? Yeah? Okay. So I'm going to read you a poem. It is an ancient Hebrew poem song and written by uh, the sons of Korah. And I'm going to start off in the second stanza and uh, just kind of lean in like a good poetry reading session, okay? And here we go. We're going to take this. Here we go. My tears have been my food day and night, while men say to me all day long, where is your God? Now think about that for a minute. Think about what the poet is writing and what he is communicating, what he is saying. Obviously, he's in a tough spot, right? And he's emotional, he's distressed, and he's in a tough spot, but it seems as though God is not listening. Anybody ever had that happen to you? You're just like, where is God? How come he's not coming through? I'm having problems here, crying out. And, and to make matters worse, there are people around him that are not being very helpful. Have you noticed that when you're going through a tough spot so many times, friends, you know, church folks, they will just say some of the stupidest, most insensitive things. Is it just me or has that happened to you as well? I mean, that's just kind of the way it goes, right? And, and so here, uh, here he is, and, and now in the midst of his struggles and of his weeping, he begins to reminisce. He says, these things I remember as I pour out my soul, and he's going to reminisce, and here's what he begins to reminisce about. He says, oh, how I used to go with the multitude, leading the procession to the house of God with shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive throng. Why are you downcast, O oh my soul? Why so disturbed within me? I want you to just take note on that first line the phrase used to, that's the key, used to, when I used to go with the multitude. What's happened here, friends? He's no longer going to the temple for worship. Apparently, he's taken offense, right? He's hurt. He's disappointed. And so what has he done? He's pulled away from God and the other worshipers. Listen, friends, disappointment with God, and that's what Pastor Kevin talked about last week, is always, almost always related, right, to disappointment with his people, which is what we're talking about this week. And so to put it in today's church growth language, the psalmist, the poet, has become de-churched, de-churched. Now, church growth specialists speak about two different groups of people, and this is not going to be hard for you to pick up on, okay? They talk about churched people, church people who are churched people. They are people who go to, you're almost a church growth specialist. There you go. They are people who go to church, the attenders, believers, Christians, right? But then there's this other group, and we call those people unchurched, and they're the people that don't go to church. You're getting this, and there are a variety of reasons, right? And of course, some of them, not only do they not go to church, but some of them have never been to church. And in America, you're seeing more and more people in this culture who have never been to church themselves. Some people won't be caught dead in church, right? They, they, they never grew up in church. They have no Christian memories, no church memories, right? And so uh, about 20 years ago or so, uh, these church growth specialists began to identify another group. There was a third group. And uh, they uh, come to realize that there were a lot of people who went to church, but they are no longer going 
to church. For a variety of reasons, they dropped out. They quit going. And so this third group was known as de-churched people, people who, for a variety of reasons, they're just no longer going. Of course, the, the question that everyone wanted ans- the answer to was why? Why are so many people leaving The church, it seems as though uh, there's a whole generation of emerging generations, and they're not just going anymore. They're questioning the church that their parents raised them in, and and these are these are 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 people that um, have have given a lot of uh, answers to the why question because that's what the researchers wanted to know. And so then several books came out about ten years ago with similar titles, such as Don Kimball's title of his book which the title is, They Like Jesus, But Not the Church. Did you pick up on that? They like Jesus, but not the church. And so as it turns out, it's not the Lord so much creating the offense as much as it's his followers that people are finding offensive. Now, of course, it's not the people that are in the 11 o'clock service because you are the folks that are just really committed, all right? It's those other people in those other services, right? Probably the Saturday night people because it's just convenient and the 930 people, they're half asleep anyway. But you th- it's those people, right? And of course, I said that to them as well. And so... <laughs> So when you dig deeper and you ask the question, well, why, why is there so much offense? And, and there are really two different kinds of offense. One, one is the personal offense, the personal offense. And everybody knows what that's about because you've, you've been offended at church if you've been coming for more than a month. I mean, you know, you've gotten your feelings hurt. Somebody cut you off in the donut line or whatever, you know, and the whole, whole thing. One thing leads to the another, but it's personal offense. And so you know those kind of stories. People collect these stories like, you know what? I was going to church, and I was doing fine. And after about five years, we had our first real problem, had our first real meltdown. I lost my job. We fell flat on our face, and, and I couldn't find all of a sudden none of our Christian friends wanted anything to do with us. They all of a sudden we couldn't find. They let us down and they even started gossiping about us and I and so we just left the church or maybe something like this you know I went to that church got saved there was getting disciple loved the pastor and man just he helped me grow and then it turned out he was a big fat phony and I said that's it the church is full of hypocrites and those are all those personal offenses and we all have different stories right I mean about things that have offended us us, right? And, but then there's those general offenses, and these have to do with these bigger groups of people that are leaving, and, and we ask, you know, these emerging generations, you know, uh, what is your perception of the church? And they begin to just say things like, you know, ask questions like, why is the church so political now? Why is the church being so judgmental? Why does the church seem so intolerant? Why does the church seem to care more about making converts than about caring for people. And man, I wish I had time to address all those different why questions that people are dealing with as we have this whole phenomena of people that are leaving the church. But friends, the main thing I just want to share with you today, and this is where sometimes in a sermon I'll say, if you don't hear anything else, make sure you hear this one. I just want to say to you, listen, friends, Jesus loves all all the people that have become de-churched. And he loves them so much that a top priority of his is to go after them, to pursue them, right? And in fact, if, if you have uh, read the Gospels, you've probably run across some of the stories Jesus told about shepherds. And in Luke chapter 15, he talks about the, it's the parable of the lost sheep. And you probably have heard this one, or if you haven't, he talks about how the shepherd that has 100 sheep, right? But there's that one sheep that leaves, that walks out of the flock, that wanders away, right? That would be called the deflocked, you, you know, a sheep and that just wanders away, right? And what does the shepherd do? What is that? That was funny. Did, that, did you not find deflocked? I thought that was kind of a funny. This sermon's not going to go near as good if you don't get up, catch up with me here, all right? All right? The shepherd goes and he 
take, he finds that lost sheep. He leaves the 99 in the open field. And when he finds that lost sheep, hoists it on his shoulder, takes it back, and tells all of his friends, rejoice with me, shepherd friends, because I have found. Friends, I want to just let you know right now, right up front, listen to me. Listen, maybe you've got your own story of being deeply wounded by the church. Maybe you've been disappointed. Maybe I could stop this sermon right now. We could break up in small groups and you could share a failure that's hurt you, some spiritual abuse that happened. Maybe you've had your own season. Maybe you look back and you say, you know what? There was a couple of years where I was de church. Or maybe you're on the verge of walking out of the church right now. But let me just throw one more maybe at you. Maybe also the fact that you are here today and I'm speaking on this topic is a little sign for you that the Lord is after you. He hasn't given up on you and he wants to pursue you, heal your heart and win you back. Friends, this is a sermon for all of us today. Do you hear me? It's for all of us today and it's also for someone we know that's not here today and hasn't been in church in a long time. So come on, let's dig in. Would you go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 7? It's the Apostle Paul's first letter to the church at Corinth. And if there's anybody that knew what it was like to get shot at by religious churchy people, it was the Apostle Paul. If you read his letters, if you read the Gospels, you see that he was taking a lot of shots, okay? And here in 1 Corinthians 6, he is writing a letter to a church that he planted, okay? And now it's a few years old, this church. But as it turns out, this has become a very troubled church. Church. If you've never read 1 Corinthians, go back and read it sometime this week, and you'll discover that almost on every page, he's dealing with a different church problem. And by the time you get to chapter 6, there's so much conflict in this church. I mean, this church had a gift of offending each other. I mean, it was the church of the, we will offend you, you know, just come and join us. It's a, quite an offensive party we have going for us. But by the time you get to chapter 6, they are literally taking each other to court. That's how offended they're getting. And look at what he writes in verse 7. The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you have been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brothers and Sisters. Now, what's going on here, friends? They're wronging each other, and in, instead of lovingly seeking forgiveness and reconciliation in private, they're going to the Roman version of Judge Judy. And they're putting on display their selfishness, their malice toward each other, their divisiveness for the whole lost world to see. Apparently, they cared more about winning their case than the damage they were doing to the kingdom of God and the mission of Jesus. Friends, listen, let it be a warning to all of us that we never be so concerned about our side of the issue, about, about our personal interests, that we would put that ahead of the interests of the kingdom of God and the mission of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So, so uh, Paul now is going to address the problem, and he's going to use this opportunity to answer that question, why does the church and Christians and church leaders fail? Why do they disappoint us? Why do they hurt us? And what should we do about it? That is the question. And one of his answers that we need to hear loud and clear is this from the Apostle Paul, whatever you do, don't give up on Jesus. You ought to start amen in me. Whatever you do, don't give up on Jesus and do not give up on the church. Do not give up on the church. It is called the body of Christ for a reason, friends. It is where Jesus dwells on earth today, and we are desperately in need for it, as imperfect as it is. And so, friends, he's going to address this question by identifying the root of the problem, and here is 
a serious root of this problem of why Christians fail, why we get offended by it, and how to deal with it. And the first root is this. It is a misunderstanding of the nature of sin. The nature of sin. Now, I know that as I look at you, you look like you're experts on sin. But we often neglect, we often miss the nature of it, okay? And that isn't the only problem, but not only do we misunderstand and misrepresent the nature of sin, but we also misunderstand and misrepresent the nature of the rescuing good news gospel of Jesus Christ as well. So I want you to notice he starts off with a warning, verse 9. He's going to start off now with a warning and follow along. Check this out. He says, or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanders, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, that's a pretty stern statement to make. What are we to make of it? What are we to take away from it, friends? Understand that in this rescue operation of the Father, when he sent his Son, here's what happens to us. We are in the process of being rescued. Listen, listen, lean in. We are being in the process of being rescued out of one kingdom so that we can be brought into a different kingdom. Amen. We are being rescued from the kingdom of this world. We're being rescued from the kingdom of darkness. Come on, amen. We are being rescued from the God of this world, and we are being brought into, rescued into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And here's the thing that we need to understand. In Jesus' kingdom, people can't just keep abusing each other. They, it, when, you, when you're re- rescued out of one community or the other, you just cannot continue to give yourself to swindling and cheating and gossiping and hurting and harming and sexual sin and ripping each other off and all those kind of a thing, right? You, you, you just can't keep on with that. And here's what, what we need to know about Jesus as our rescuer. He is not going to force us into his kingdom ever. You see, it is always a volunteer thing. Today, you're going to get an opportunity to surrender your life to Jesus. Nobody's going to force you to do it. I'm not going to badger you. I'm, I'm not going to try to pull the levers on you. I'm just going to give you an opportunity to, to exercise your own free will and to begin to allow Jesus to rescue you. But he never strong arms us. And friends here, I mean, what, what, what you need to understand is, l- listen, if anybody insists on living outside of his authority, he's not going to force himself on you, right? I mean, he's not going to insist on anybody, on anybody. He's not going to strong arm you. Listen, he'll always let us choose the trajectory of our own life, whether we're going to church or not, whether you signed a card or not, made a commitment or not, attended a class or not. But to really understand what Paul's trying to communicate here, we really need to add the next sentence to the sentences that are on the screen today. And so I'm going to rewind, and I'm going to read verse 9 and 10 one more time, but this time we're going to add verse 11 in just a minute. But I want you to help me, because I want to read this again, but this time I want you to pretend that you are a self-righteous, judgmental Christian. Now, I know that you're going to have to act on this because, I mean, you're going to have to win an Academy Award here, all right, because I know what I'm dealing with here in the 11 o'clock service. You're very godly people here, all right, but, but here, here's the thing. I want you to receive this as though, listen, you are, you are one of those kind of people that looks down your nose at everybody else, and you're so self-righteous, okay? So here we go. I'm going to read it one more time. Are you ready? All right. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? All right, now you're not getting this. All right, I want you to be really self-righteous and just really like, you know, mean. All right, okay? All right, we're going to keep going here. We're going to keep going. Do not be deceived, neither the... No, 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 no. You're not reading with me. You're responding in a self-righteous way. Saturday at 930 did not have a problem with this. I'm reading, you're reacting like a self-righteous person. All right, here we go. All right. Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral nor idolaters. There you go. 
a little pharisaical, yeah. Preach it, pastor. Nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanders, nor swindlers. No, no, no. Start looking at, would you? All right, all right, all right, all right. All right. You're doing good, but now, more stage direction here. I want you to look at other people now. Just kind of look around. Look, Come on, look at other people. There's got to be somebody here that's an adulterer. That, come on, there's got to be somebody that's a thief this week. Somebody's greedy. Come on, look around. Look down your nose. Do, do one of these. None of them are going to inherit the kingdom of God. Now, here it is. And that is what some of you were. <laughs> All right, can we be righteous again now, Christ-like, please? All right. <laughs> you get what you ask for, don't you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's what I was. You see, friends, sin isn't just a list of bad behaviors. It's a condition, and it affects all of us. Christians and non-Christians alike. Can I tell you something? When it comes to sin, we're all in the same boat. Do you hear me? Yes, we are in the process of being rescued from this kingdom into this kingdom, but what happens when you get over on this side is you can all of a sudden get really self-righteous and begin to see those people over there are the ones that struggle with sin, but let's not be deceived, brothers and sisters. Sin is a condition, and it affects the entire human race. In fact, we have all been diagnosed with a spiritual malignancy. Yes, sir, we all have sin cancer. That's right. We all deal with it. We all deal with it. In fact, I went to the, not the sin doctor, but the skin doctor this past week. And almost every, I go once a year, almost every time I go, he digs something out of me. He did it again this week. It, I, he, he took a little chunk out of my arm. Would you like to see it? Come here. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to tell you. No, no, TMI. TMI. The reality is, if we're really growing in Christ, if we're really following Jesus from time to time, if we could see each other spiritually, we're going to be walking in this room with a new little thing cut out. Come on, amen. Because we continue to deal with sin. Every one of us. No one is ever going to be declared sin-free in this life. You know how... You can't just flip a switch at the altar and have all your sin issues vanish. Doesn't work that way. And so this means that no one should ever be shocked when Christians sin, when we blow it, when we fail, when we mess up, when we disappoint. Now, people that aren't following Jesus have a hard time with this. So, friends, can we lead the way and get and understand this and quit being shocked when we find out that somebody had to go to the skin doctor and get some sin cut out? Come on, amen. Somebody's blown it. Somebody's messed up. And, friends, listen, leaders are this, including Christian leaders, pastors, priests, bishops, we sin, we blow it. We fail. Now, let's, let's be balanced here. Leaders should not be novices. The Bible is clear on that. The scriptures say, Paul gives a direction. Don't just lay hand, hands on people. Don't just willy-nilly make leaders out of people. Hey, you're breathing and you've, you know, you're, you're, well, you're a leader. You're a leader. You're a leader. We got to get some leadership going. No, leaders, Christian leaders are to be men and women of proven character. Amen. Who give evidence of a growing relationship with Jesus. But listen, the first sign of a healthy church is a place where the leaders don't pretend to be perfect. Where they don't act like they're beyond sin, beyond failure. 
You know, the first sign of a healthy church, you know, is the, the leadership that, that's truly honest about their own frailty. You know, there's never this hierarchy of, oh, oh we're the ones that are up here. We're, we're up on the thrones, up looking down at the rest of the poor congregation, still struggling with things like, oh, but, oh, look at the leaders. Aren't they wonderful? Oh, no, brothers and sisters, a healthy place are churches that are honest about their own propensity to sin. That means you need to look around wherever you're at and ask, are there accountability? structures in place? Are people submitted to authority? Have guard rail, Are there guardrails in place in daily life? Are, do leaders have trusted friends with whom they are practicing confession and forgiveness of sin? Oh, brothers and sisters, listen. Unchecked spiritual authority, unaccountable spiritual authority will always lead to spiritual abuse. Do you hear me? And it will, over time, create a poisonous, caustic church culture. It will lead to things like the cult of personality and, and people, you know, be put up on pedestals. And, oh, we've got to surround them and protect their reputation. Oh, friends, let me just say with the lights on, oh, by your grace, King Jesus, keep me. Come on, amen. Keep the leaders of this church. Come on, amen. Would you continue to help us at Chapel Springs to create a healthy, accountable, come on, amen, honest culture here at Chapel Springs for his glory. Yes, amen. Please, Lord. Please, Lord. But even with all that in place, sin can still get the best of us and do damage. Now, I'm going to say something, and you have permission to spread this. It's, an, it's news. It ain't fake news. It's news. Since I've been the pastor of this church, I've sinned. I've failed. I've blown it. I've caused offense as a pastor. I'm going to take a minute and briefly share with you an abridged list of examples. I have misused humor at other people's expense. You see, when I grew up, I was always the smallest kid in my class. I was smaller than all the girls. I was actually the smallest, by far, puniest little kid in the class, and I would get bullied. I would get bullied. I'm not going to tell you what they did to me, okay? Already been through support group. Already, I'm free. <laughs> Usually. So I developed humor. There was this guy named John Meluso in fourth grade Mrs. Carr's class. He was the class bully, John Meluso. Does that sound like a bully? He would always wear a white dress shirt, and he would roll his sleeves up, and he always walked around with his rolls. He was ready for a fight at all times. But he loved me because I made him laugh. I, I, I could make John Meluso laugh. Your attention is being held in this sermon right now today, and you need to thank John Meluso. Let's just thank you, John. Scott learned how to make the bullies laugh. In fact, that will be the title of my autobiography if I ever write it. Okay? <laughs> but as a youth pastor and a preacher and, you know, loving humor, I discovered someone came to me and said, do you know that you are b brutalizing some of the kids in your youth group? It's just like anything for a joke. You need to knock it off. And I'm so thankful somebody came to me. And from that moment on, I have tried to live by, by if you're going to make people laugh, let them laugh at my expense. And you've never failed me any Sunday. I just thank you very much. <laughs> I, 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 I have focused on tasks instead of people. I've done it as the lead pastor of this church. I, I, will, I, I will get so focused on the next sermon, on the fact that, you know, you know don't these people know I'm preaching three times this weekend and I got to get to the next thing and I got to get to the next thing. Don't bother me. I got to go to the bridge. You know, I just jump. And, and, and there have been times I know because people have come to me and said, you just seem like you're not paying attention to people. And I've actually offended people because I've been so tasked that I haven't paid attention to people. And I've discovered something that, that, that paying attention to people is more important than good sermons. Okay? So you have permission to call me on it. Like next Sunday, if I'm stomping through the foyer to the next service, say, hey, Scott. <laughs> it's about people. All right? I, I've, I've neglected 
I've neglected some important things. There have been people that, I mean, close people, people I've known, that, and, you know, a f- close family member died, and I neglected to call them for a couple of weeks. Uh, there have been times when I should have been somewhere at, at, at someone's side, and I wasn't there because I just, I just let my flesh get lazy, and I just, you know, I'm just going to not, you know, and this. And, friends, I have offended people. And it's not funny. And uh, I've said this in every service. If I have offended you, and uh, uh, I, I'm, I, I don't want to just do a blanket, you know, it would be easy in a sermon like this to say, okay, everybody, hey, I've been here for 30 years. If I've offended you, I apologize and just wipe the slate clean, right? It wouldn't be the easy thing. But really, if, if I have somehow offended you, and it has really begun to, it's affected you, and it's, it's deeper than just, you know, hey, you walked by one time, would you please speak up? Would you please call me? And let's get together and let's get it right. Because I don't want it to negatively affect your relationship with Jesus. Now, I've notified the administrative staff to be prepared. We will begin to (laughs) set up 15-minute increments, you know, and get you hopefully through in this next week. But so we need to understand the nature of sin. It affects us all. But we also need to face this problem that we often misunderstand the nature of the very gospel that Jesus has given us to rescue us from our sin. I want you to notice the verb tense at the end of that statement. And that is what some of you were. Notice it's past tense, isn't it? It's not present tense. It's past tense. The reality is that sin is a cancer that affects everyone, but God sent someone to do something about it. Amen. And yes, we still struggle with sin, but the message is that it no longer has to define who we are. Amen. You see, there is this tension if you're growing in Christ and you understand the nature of sin and the nature of the gospel. And that tension, that healthy tension force is this. Yes, I'm being delivered out of this kingdom into this kingdom, but I need to always walk in humility and understand that I can never look down my nose at those people. They're the ones that still deal with sin. No, sir, that's not the truth. I'm still struggling with it. I still deal with sin. But here's the thing that's the tension. The Lord wants us always to know we may still deal with sin and struggle with it, but it no longer has to define who we are. And here's why. It's the next verse. I want you to read it with me. It's 7 after 12. Lunch is coming. Let's finish strong. Come on, read it with me like you're doing the preaching. Come on. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Somebody get happy today. Let's give God praise. Amen. I said this at Easter. I want to say it again. I ought to say it every Sunday. It wouldn't hurt. The gospel is not about what we do. It's about what God has done for us. I want you to notice what it doesn't say in verse 11. It doesn't say that is what some of you were, but you're now teaching a Sunday school class. You started attending church regularly. You, you started giving in the offering. Don't stop. Okay, I'm just illustration. You served in the nursery. You haven't cussed since Tuesday. You didn't cheat on your taxes this year. Well, not as much as you did last year. It's a process, sanctification, everything in moderation. (laughs) No, it doesn't say any of that. Why? Because we're not what we used to be, not because of anything we've done, but only what God has done for us. Friends, listen. Here's the thing we've got to face. It's much more evident to say amen when someone's preaching it. We can all agree about it, but we've got to be careful and vigilant about the many ways in which we don't live like it, talk like it, act like it, and teach others like it, friends. Many people, even within the church, we mistakenly think that Christians are people who try to live like Jesus. 
And if I'd have said it in a different way with a lot of fire, you might have amen that. We ought to all try to live like Jesus. Amen, Pastor Preacher. That's not the gospel. That's not the nature of the gospel. Too often we act as though Christianity is, is all about, I mean, it is the best self-help program the world has ever seen because Jesus was sinless and he's our moral example. And so let's all run out of this kingdom, run over to this kingdom because Jesus is our example and now let's all try to be like him. Let's wear WWJD bracelets and let's just go through our day and say, what would Jesus do right now? Oh, he would do this. Okay, I'm going to try to do that. I'm going to try to do this. I'm going to try to do that. And I'm going to, friends, listen, if that's what it's about, then those who succeed at it should be on a very high pedestal today. Give them awards. Let them write books that all of us want to buy. And hopefully one day, if we're lucky, we'll be in the same room, in the same line, and we can have them sign our copy. Oh, isn't Pastor Scott wonderful? Look at how he has climbed the ladder far beyond all of us. Just keep following him. There's his tush. Keep following Pastor Scott up the ladder. He's trying to be like Jesus. Oh, to be like him. Hogwash. Once we understand the nature of sin, we understand that it's a cancer that none of us are ever completely free of in this life. And once we understand the nature of the gospel, then we will say, if anything good would ever come out of Pastor Scott, it's only because he's been washed. Can I get an amen? He's been sanctified. He's been justified. In whose name? In whose name? In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God, by grace that he pours out into our lives. One of my favorite verses is Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. Just the first phrase. It's all good, and and I'm not abusing it out of context, but here's what it says. See to it that no one misses the grace of God. If we took that statement and we lived by it for about six months and together we focused on the reality of what the gospel is and the reality of the nature of sin, who knows? We might quit offending people out there in the world. May the cross be the offense. May the Jesus who taught us how to live and, taught us and, and lived it out, may he be the offense. Because Hebrews 12 says, if you miss the grace of God, then bitter roots are going to grow up, and it's going to defile many people. And that's what people do when they wrongly think the gospel is the best self-help program the world has ever seen. We had a family member. I can tell this story because I'm quite certain that none of my family is watching me right now on the Internet. I won't mention any names. He ran away from the Lord as a teenager, grew up in church, sowed his wild oats, got in all kinds of trouble. You know, he was the kid that the whole family's praying for, right? Grandma's praying for all the aunts and uncles. Everybody's praying, 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 pray for so-and-so, pray for so-and-so. More trouble, deeper trouble. Where's this thing headed? On a highway to hell. Here he goes. Here he goes again. What's going to happen? What's going to happen? And then finally, we got the word that God had reached down into the pit and rescued this family member. Next time we got, went down there, man, hallelujah, he had a story to tell. Miraculous. Yeah, family members, you're like, wow, I don't know where this thing's going to head. Lord, can you really do this? And then, boom, boom, hallelujah. Got his Bible. He's reading the Bible. He's going to church. Got rid of some old friends. Got some new friends. I'm like, yes. We're high five. Next year, we go back down. And I was just amazed at how quickly he had become so harsh with other people. Critical. Judgmental. 
I mean, in conversation, right, Thanksgiving, it's like, you know, so-and-so and this and that, I can't believe this, and just kind of like all of a sudden just so, I mean, just months. I'm like, my goodness, you know, and since then, we've had a lot of talks, and thank the Lord, he, God brought him out of that. But at that moment, it's like I wanted to shake him, just shake him. I wanted to just shake him hard. Just, do you not remember what you were like 12 months ago? Was it anything you did? God rescued your sorry. <laughs> Pulled you out of the fire. What kind of preaching was he hearing? What kind of church did he go to? What kind of groups was he in to get that smug, self-righteous? Mm. Oh, brothers and sisters, the gospel is totally a work of God's grace at the beginning, at the end, and every moment in between. Hallelujah. Let's stand up together. Amen. Come on, let's read it, and let's put our own pronoun in there. I was washed. Can we read it all together? You ready? Let's do it. But I was washed. I was sanctified. I was justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Come on, let's give God praise. Let's give him... Let's give them a lot of praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We've got time to respond. We've got time to respond. Lord, I just pray that we'll control our thought life right now and not immediately think about where we're going to eat and how we got to get out of here. Holy Spirit, come and do your work in our hearts. Jesus, we don't just want to get together and expound scripture and laugh a little, cry a little, and just work you into our schedule. Lord, would you just come and do a work you need to do in our hearts, Jesus, right now? Lord, where forgiveness needs to flow, where we've offended someone, God, I just pray you do your work. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, you're welcome in this place. In Jesus' name. We're going to start singing a little song of response. And as we sing, I want to invite you. I want to invite you, if you'd like, if you'd like to come and pray for a few minutes, if you want to, you know, whatever your need is today, would you just come and come and just begin to stand across the front. Come, come and begin to stand front. Next week is missions. We're not going to do this next week. We're going to have a couple weeks. We're going to focus on the Word. But right now, can we just focus on the body, focus on the church, and whatever you'd like prayer for today, would you just come and just come in across, across the front here in just a moment. We're going to sing a little song uh, of, of response and whatever your need is today, but especially if you're responding to this message today, if you want, if you want God to do a deep work, we want God to do a deep work of grace in our heart today before we leave. Would you come before we get ready to pray in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, as the song begins to sing, come and join us right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. I surrender. Yes, Jesus. I surrender all. Everything. Yes, Jesus. Nothing less. Yes, Jesus. Oh, I surrender, I surrender all, mm. I surrender, and I surrender, I surrender all, everything, oh Jesus, we trust you, oh I Everything and everything and nothing less. I give you everything and nothing less. Forever, everything and nothing less. My life is yours, completely yours. Everything. Nothing less. I give you everything and nothing less. Forever, everything and nothing less. My life is yours, completely yours. Jesus. Can we just begin to surrender? to the Lord our offenses right now. Just begin to lay them down. Lord, past hurts. Let me just, I'm just going to ask Jesus for the
privilege to do this. If you've been offended in church, not just this church, if you've been offended by a pastor, can I just, Lord, if you give me the grace to be able to represent your leaders of the church, Jesus, and just ask people for forgiveness today. Yes, we, we, we're, we're made of clay, right? We're, 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 we're frail. We have our own issues, but that's no excuse. That's no excuse for failures and sin and, and spiritual abuse and, you know, uh, t- taking power and, and, and using it in an abusive way. That's a horrific sin. And Jesus, forgive us. But, but friends, listen, would you just allow Jesus to do a deep work of healing in your life? Oh, he's after you. He's the good shepherd. Amen. His heart is for those who are hurting today. Let him come and just begin to do a deep work in your life. Maybe right now the Lord is bringing a face to you. He's bringing a name to you. Somebody that you need to do some business with. Maybe you need to speak up. Listen, don't just walk away. Don't just, but speak up. Go to the person that's offended you. Some of us need to go to somebody we know we've offended. We need to just take that step, and we need to ask for forgiveness today. We need to to send an email. We need to write a note. We need to invite somebody out for coffee this week. Jesus, would you just, Lord, let healing flow today in Jesus' name. Come on, amen. In Jesus' name, do that deeper work, we pray. In the name of Jesus. Uh, I want to ask some of my prayer team folks to be available to just come and stand on both sides of the stage right now. If we could have three or four people on both sides. Listen, if you'd like prayer today, you want somebody to agree with you in prayer, would you come and don't walk out of here with getting, getting a little work done spiritually. You need somebody to come alongside you. Put an arm on your shoulder, please. Be responsive today. You step out. Be responsive today. I need some folks on this side of the stage right here. I don't see anybody making a move. I need some of my leadership people to come and just be ready to pray. I'm both sides of the of the auditorium here just be ready if you'd like to accept Jesus as your savior let me tell you you don't need a special appointment today is the day come on amen, amen. if you're here in church and you know you know what I'm not right with God I need to get right with God don't let another moment go by this is the right place to get right with Jesus come on yeah. amen amen, amen. Come and put the white flag up. Pray a prayer. Ask him to forgive you of your sin today. Just say, Jesus, would you forgive me? Lord, I want to turn away from my old life. I want a new life. Lord, would you make me new today? Friends, the, the, old, the old way can begin to pass away and new ways can come to you in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now, Lord, we just surrender ourselves to you today as we've sung. We just present ourselves to you today. Lord, may your grace flow through your church today, we pray. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Friends, some of us, the Lord's calling you to go after someone in love, to represent the Good Shepherd. Remember I said this message today isn't just for us, but it's for people that aren't here today. Amen? People you know that have left the church. Can we pray for them right now? Lord Jesus, come on, join me in prayer. Lord, we pray for all those people that have been de-churched. God, we pray for emerging generations, Lord, that are walking out the doors. God, I pray for all the issues that are, that are, that are creating this offense. Lord, may the only offense be the cross and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. God, I just pray that you would help us and teach us. And Lord, we pray, Lord, for all those that have wandered off. I know we got people here that are concerned about family members. We're concerned about about people in our life. Lord, we just pray, Jesus, for friends, neighbors, coworkers, people we know that have walked out of the church. Lord, would you keep them on our hearts? And would you use us this day to be a voice of love and reconciliation for your honor and your glory. And we thank you in Jesus' name. We thank you in Jesus' name. Can we give it an amen today? We just give praise to Jesus today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Listen, next Sunday, Missions Week starts. It is a very special week at our church. We are in the midst of a missionary movement at Chapel Springs. We are living like missionaries right here in Northern Virginia. And you need to be a part of it. And we are seeing more and more people being sent out from this congregation to points around the world. Hallelujah. And so this week, I want to encourage you. Would you prepare your heart? Begin to pray about your commitment to missions this year. About praying. About giving. About going. Come on, amen. In Jesus' name. And listen, everybody ought to be a part of Dinner with a Missionary. 
out in the foyer, you're going to see that white fake brick wall. That's where you sign up for dinner with the missionary. Not this week, but next week. Throughout the week, you get together with some other Chapel Springs people. You make some new friends. You share a potluck dinner, and you get to be up close and personal with a missionary from somewhere around the world. Man, you need to be a part of it. Go sign up before you leave today. God bless you now. Let's go live for Jesus.